folks, this is Coach Corbin, and as many of my listeners know by this time, I have changed the name of my podcast to The True American. Um, many of you by this time, you've heard the, the history of that, but The True American was the name of a, a uh, abolitionist newspaper, abolitionist newspaper founded by Cassius Clay. Yes, I said Cassius Clay, and Cassius Clay was a Republican. A Kentucky politician, and, a, and what many characterize as a radical abolitionist. That man was deadly serious about seeing that slavery was removed from American soil, because in his view, that you know to be a slaveholder was not to be a true American. So that was the name of his newspaper, The True American. It's the name of my podcast, The True American, and uh, bringing his brother on. That's probably one of the best ways you can describe him, a true American. If you want to understand American values, history, you better go to this brother. Because he's rare. He's... Now, brother, you're about to, your election, isn't it coming up soon? Yes, uh, the primary is May 17th, uh, <clears throat> Republican primary, and there's no Democrat running. So basically, the, whoever wins the Republican primary will be the representative for District 36. Fantastic. And you feel pretty confident about being able to pull that off, winning? Well, I'm certainly giving it uh, my best shot. I, I feel like I've got, got a real good chance, but uh, still have to convince enough people to pick my name off a list. You know, it's yeah. uh, it's about earning that name recognition, getting out and meeting enough people yes. that they know who to vote for. And I, I tell you one thing, you know, speaking to my listeners, folks, we need more thoughtful politicians like this, brother. Um I always get the impression when you speak to a lot of elected officials, they know the sound bites, they, they, they know the trigger points, but if you actually just sat down with them and said, ask them like basic questions, thoughtful questions, they're going to they're gonna stumble and stutter. This brother can sit down and like on one or two points about the United States of America, he can sit there and give you a whole lecture. And that's the kind of brothers we need in the Kentucky legislature, you know, like, you know, like some of those guys, who was this one guy, Henry Clay? Yeah. You know, folks like that. That's what we need. And that's what we have if you put someone like him in office. But anyway, let me get off that. I don't want people to think I'm endorsing you or anything like that, but I will say this. I will be I running up and work. I will be running up and down Broadway if you win. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Appreciate it. brother, I have you on. We we only got so much time. I always try to keep my interviews 15 to 20 minutes. What is this bill I've heard about that's in the Kentucky legislature dealing with transgender athletes? You know, you know, educate us, brother. Okay, well, there's a couple of bills in the legislature. I think there's a House Bill 23 and a Senate Bill uh, 83, I think, cover the same subject matter uh, <clears throat> regarding participation in, in uh, sports by transgender uh, athletes. But before I talk about that, let me back up a little bit to the 1960s. Uh, I was born in the 60s. I was an athlete in Texas. And along around 1972, about 50 years ago, some legislation, that federal legislation that came to be known as Title IX was passed. Mm -hmm. What Title IX essentially did was it told uh, people receiving federal funds that they needed to have equivalent funding for boys and girls sports uh, for scholarship opportunities. Previous to that, in the 50s and 60s, um, college scholarships for athletics were largely a male thing. Um, but with some of the uh, civil rights movement and uh, movement for gender equality, they said, hey, you know, girls play sports too. They should have an equal chance with the boys to go to college. Now, granted, the girls sports don't make as much revenue. You know, men's college football, college basketball are huge revenue leaders, but nonetheless, an equivalent number of female athletes were going to be given college scholarship opportunities as male athletes. And that had an impact on me starting college as, as a, I was on the track team in college, believe it or not, shot put, not running. I want to clarify that, but uh, there were not as many male scholarships given out in 1979 because they had to make room in the budget for an equivalent number of female uh, student athletes. And that was some important legislation. Uh, you know, my mother played a little bit of college basketball 100 years ago, and, mm. and uh, you know, there were no, no such thing as scholarship opportunities for girls at, at that time. Uh, but starting in 1972, there were increasing numbers, and there's a tremendous number 
of, uh, of girls college scholarship athletic opportunities now the reason they were separated out in 1972 is when you had a handful of women that tried to play co-ed sports but it's just a genetic fact that males are bigger faster stronger have more lung capacity more red blood cells all kinds of athletic factors that an objective scientific test give them an advantage in sports over females there are a handful of sports where that you know may not be a factor like say archery uh you mm-hmm. know, curling uh, things like that that there are, are sports are co-ed anybody can participate uh but <clears throat> for the things that involve strength speed stamina uh the ability to uh, absorb collisions uh, you know boxing things like that mm-hmm. the huge advantage of males over females you know in the typically in a, in a given sport like say track you know the the world's champion uh female athlete the world record holder uh you know couldn't even place in a tournament with you know fairly uh, more average college male athletes mm. so that's the reason the title nine was to protect women and to give women an opportunity to participate in athletics on an equal footing uh, with men in terms of federal funding college scholarships and the things that being a student athlete are supposed to be about which are going to school playing athletics getting your education paid for as a result of that so that's been the law of the land here for about 50 years and it changed the shape of of college athletics and as a consequence high schools changed their athletic programs because more and more girls said hey i want to go to college and get a volleyball scholarship or a yeah. field hockey scholarship track scholarship yeah. something of that nature um, <clears throat> so that proceeded along quite well for uh for decades and then we've had this recent social phenomenon about transgenderism and now we have the situation where biological males people who are born boys have an x and a y chromosome they have had testosterone their entire life they've got heavier musculature heavier skeletons more aerobic capacity they decide at some point in their high school college career that they're going to start dressing like a female identify as a female and go participate in female sports and what happens is they immediately start dominating the field uh, we've got this uh, swimming athlete that was uh, uh, born a biological male that is blowing away all the female uh, records in swimming. And what this does, this is not a victory for the biological male who identifies as a female. This is a this is a, a defeat for females in athletics because they're being denied that chance to get that gold medal that they have been seeking all their life. They're being denied their chance for college scholarship and to uh, compete on equal footing. And the reason that you can tell that that is the case is because there are only a tiny number of biological women trying to compete in men's sports. It typically only goes one direction. It's biological men wanting to compete in women's sports where they have a huge advantage. Mm -hmm. I don't think it has anything to do with, uh, with equality, uh, or equal treatment under the law. I think it has, has to do with people are seeking a competitive advantage over those, uh, uh, female athletes. Uh, in sports like wrestling and boxing, uh, can be extremely dangerous for the for the females. For have a bigger, stronger uh, male hit them. You know, we've had some serious injuries, and I believe even a death in an MMA fight by someone mm-hmm. who was a biological male competing as a female. Right. So, with that in mind, <clears throat> the House and the Senate took up this legislation, and I think House Bill Twenty Three um, is sponsored by uh, a several good. Uh, representatives basically says if you're a biological boy you can't complete and compete in girls sports uh k-12 through and even on up into college the senate version of the bill restricts it a little more i think it's only grade six through 12 uh but the house bill would be my preference because at all ages you know boys have 10 times the amount of circulating testosterone in their system that girls do and it gives them an enormous athletic advantage and even being uh, if you have gender conversion therapy, hormone therapy, it takes years, years to ever undo the impact of, of all those years of testosterone. And even then, you're still left with somebody that might be six foot five and 230 pounds, you know, competing against biological females. It's just yeah. not fair. So mm-hmm. Title IX, 1972, was all about creating equal opportunity for female athletes with male athletes. Transgender males going into girls' sports wipes all that out. So it's a huge step backwards for women in, in athletics. And that's that's why I support that. Someone can identify themselves any way they want to in America. They can dress however they want to. There's you know activities they can participate in that are uh, you know open to both sexes. But in the case where being a male gives you a biological advantage, it is just not right to have those males competing in 
female sports, regardless of how they identify. Brother, I couldn't, okay. agree, I couldn't agree with you more. And, and what sort of concerns me, what I don't understand, where I'm confused is that, you know, once again, folks, what did I say? Reasonable, thoughtful individual. How could you argue against what this brother just said? You know, this is not, he's not spewing out hatred. He's not talking about, oh, I hate transgender or anything like that. He's just, just laid out the facts, period. Talked about the science, period. But yet we have some individuals, brother, this is what I don't get. We have some individuals who are still insisting that, oh, no, uh, we should have these males who think they're women competing against women. I, I just, intellectually, I don't see how they're able to justify something like that when it just so brazenly goes against the science. Right. And I think the, the legislation takes you back to the gender that's on your official unaltered birth certificate. You just can't change, change that biology later in mind. And, and if you can change it, you can change. If it is changeable, you can change to one gender and then change back in a couple of years if you want to, uh, mm -hmm. you know, so there, when we were born, every cell in my body and your body has an X and a Y chromosome that affects the way that body works. Every cell in a woman's body has two X chromosomes. And that's a, it's, it's, it's very different nature. I like to say, if this were really about something else, you would see scores of women wanting to compete in male athletics. And you don't see that because they know mm -hmm. they're at a tremendous competitive disadvantage. What you see is biological men want to compete in girls and women's sports. And I think, we need, as a society, we need to protect women just like Title IX tried to do in 1972 to equalize mm -hmm. those opportunities for women, women in sports. So right. we're kind of reversing, uh, you know, 50 years of progress for women in competing on, on uh, financially equal footing with males. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's a good point. I remember when I was in high school and I had a crush on this girl and she wanted to play um, basketball. And she had to, brother, she had to go out and recruit other girls in the high school. She had to go out, and then those girls had to go out and look for a coach. They wanted to play basketball, but they wanted to play women's basketball. They weren't crazy and foolish and talking about, oh, we want to be on the men's or the boys' basketball team. They wanted their own. They wanted their own. Her brother played. Her brother's real good, she, but she could never outrun, outjump her brother. She understood that. She got that. And so I'll n I never forgot that because she has such a great desire for that. And then she started dreaming. It was just a dream, brother, about being able to go to college on a basketball scholarship. Nowadays, as you know, you know, there are a lot of women who are able to do that. But what helped pave the way were, you know, that young woman who I had that crush on back in high school. They paved the way for that. And now it's all being, being taken away. Yes, absolutely destroyed and, and completely eradicated. And then it seems like if a lot of these young ladies speak out about it, oh, all of a sudden they're they're bigots, they're, they're Nazis, they're evil, they're hateful. Right. I think, you know, that's what they call an ad hominem attack. You're attacking the person for their policy position. Uh, they've got a reasonable policy position, but you're going to start name calling to try to try to marginalize them. Mm -hmm. and that's not right. You know, you look at other areas, just in men's sports, if you look at uh, boxing, wrestling, MMA, things like that, there's weight mm. classes. Because it's really not fair for a 280-pound guy to mm. go fight a 120-pound guy in the ring. You know, the <laughs> little guy may be faster, but <laughs> if the big guy catches him, it's over, you know. Yeah, right, and you right. occasionally see, see some superb athletes can, you know, go up maybe one or two weight classes. But nobody goes as a flyweight and goes up to, uh, you know, heavyweight mm -hmm. uh, to compete because they get crushed. and. Like I say, we actually had a death in uh, women's MMA uh, doing mm. that. A biological male, you know, just caved in the head of a, of a female. Give her a, I, b I believe she died from that injury. But, um, mm. Wow. So we need to protect women's opportunities in athletics. Absolutely. And letting, letting men play in, girl, in girls and women's sports is not the way to do that. Right. And, and brother, um, and I know other Kentuckians must, you know, you know, feel that way. I mean, is it? Do you think it's helpful that, that Kentuckians who want to protect women's sports, and I think this is really what it's about, protecting women's sports, protecting the, the opportunities for women, is it helpful that they call their house rep? Or? 
Yes, absolutely is. Uh, there's a legislative message line uh, that you can call and leave a message for your house rep on those bills. It's uh, House Bill 23, Senate Bill 63. And uh, let them know how you feel. Uh, that that does make a difference. Um, you know, when they, when they hear from constituents on those things, because uh, some things are controversial and people don't don't want to get called, you know, names. They don't want to be accused of being, a, you know, bigot for taking what I think is a very reasonable policy mm-hmm. position. That uh, legislative message line, by the way, is 800-372-7181. And uh, that's, a, that's a good way that you can tell them your address and they will connect you up with your representative and your senator and you can okay. voice your opinion on that or any number of bills. But I think citizen participation in legislation is critical because these guys are, you know, 100 miles away in, in Frankfurt, even farther for a lot of people in the state. And uh, they need to hear from the people they represent on issues. A lot of times there's just silence. Uh, and in politics, the people who show up win and the people who show up and shout the loudest win. Mm. Um, and <clears throat> certain special interest groups in our society have done a good job of showing up and shouting louder than what I think the vast majority of people have. But yeah. if we want to have a free country, if we want to have uh, you know, the government of we the people collectively, citizens have to make their voice heard with their legislators in Frankfurt. Mm-hmm. And I think they also need to uh, make sure that we get uh, thinking people like yourself up there representing well, I, them. I recommend that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, brother. Brother, let me go over that number one more time. 1-800-372-7181. Uh, yes, that's correct. Okay. 800-372-7181. All right. Call that number, folks. Talk to your representative. Let them know you support Senate Bill 63 and House Bill 23. Brother, thank you so much. As always, I learn a lot. It's always great talking to you, Corbin. All right. Let's keep in touch, brother. Will do. Thanks a lot.